you have to turn it to the side to see it, but it says life is too short to get it wrong. Why not get it right? And a lot of us have screwed up our lives over the years. Some of you come in here today and you're carrying guilt, you're carrying shame, you're trying to forget stuff. Some of you are still hooked on stuff, whatever that stuff is. And it's just not a, a matter of being, being hooked on stuff, but it's a matter of what you're missing out on. Because there's something so much better, quote, than often the things that we try to fill our life up with. So with that in mind, let me jump in. The title of the day is The Most Important Question Ever Asked. So uh, a preacher, a 19th century circuit riding preacher named Peter Cartwright, was preparing to deliver a sermon one Sunday when he was warned that President Andrew Jackson was in attendance. And he was asked to keep his remarks inoffensive. Why aren't we living in a day like that? During that message, he included these statements. I have been told that Andrew Jackson is in the congregation, and I have been asked to guard my comments. What I must say is this. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. After the sermon, Jackson strode up to the Cartwright, Mr. Cartwright. Sir, President said, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could win the world. You see, what we're lacking today is men who not only have a relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ, but men who don't. A lot of men who do have that relationship aren't doing much with it. It's more like get your ticket punched so you can go to heaven and you live like hell. But if we're not banded together as a team to take a city, to take a state, to take a country. And a lot of times we just need a greater backbone, greater persistence, greater courage, greater passion. But you just can't wump it up. There's a key to all of that and how you can get to the point where you're that kind of man that Andrew Jackson was pointing to when we need it today. So that's what I want to talk about. Max Licato, one of the great writers, communicator of our time out of uh, San Antonio, said he was asked a question one day in an interview, why suicide rates are rising? So many people are feeling anxious, he said. That's why. My hunch, he went on to say, is that we are seeing the fruits of a secular society. When we raise up a generation of people and tell them that all of life is just what they can see, what they can touch, what they can hear, in other words, there's no transcending beyond us power, there's no good God overseeing the affairs of mankind, you remove that society, my feeling is that that creates a discouraged society. He added, secularism sucks hope out of people's lives. And let me tell you, he hit it, he nailed it on the head. So, the question I want to start with today is why are so many people empty? Uh, you can make a big deal, you can cash in, time goes by, and you get that empty feeling. Well, I guess then I have to have another deal. And then I feel empty, and I got another deal. Well, I have a little something on the side over here because I'm not getting it at home, so that, that, that doesn't last very long. Well, i got to get another one. On and on and on we go, trying to fill the hole in our heart with something that will fulfill us. Harrison Ford, the actor, said this. He said, um, the most successful actor in the history of Hollywood whose movies have grossed over $2 billion, told a magazine interviewer, you, viewer, you only want what you ain't got. What ain't you got? Peace was his response. Now, let me tell you, peace doesn't come just because we have a waterfall behind us and smooth music on the radio or whatever the playing device is. It's much deeper than that. Uh, Ted Turner described life as being like a B-grade movie. You don't want to leave in the middle, but you don't want to see it again. <laughs> kind of sad. Comedian Eddie Murphy said this to People Magazine, I don't think there's anyone who feels like there isn't something missing in their life. No matter how much money you make, how many cars or houses you have, or how many people make you happy, life isn't perfect for anybody. And that's true. 
So I heard the story about a man who was extremely unhappy. And he went to a psychiatrist, and he said, I'm just looking for direction and meaning and purpose in my life. Uh, counselor said, well, forget about all those things. Go and see the comedian who's performing at the local comedy club. I hear he is keeping people in stitches. Go listen to him, and you'll forget about all your troubles. There was a pause, and then the man said, I am the comedian. I had a friend, he's not here anymore, he's with the Lord, uh, met him in Houston, helped him into a relationship with Christ, he moved to Austin, did work there for years, um, but one of the things about my buddy, <clears throat> he was funny, but a lot of, behind a lot of his humor and his jokes and his sarcasm was a very lonely, hurting person. And we can do that, whether it was with humor, whether it's with uh, trying to top somebody else's story. We Hundreds of ways that we hide the ache in our heart and the emptiness in our lives. Augustine said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man that only, only Christ can fill. But we keep trying to cram stuff in there, don't we? Lord, maybe this time it'll work. Maybe this will help. Maybe that counselor can help. And I'm not against going to counselors if they're good and if they're based on this book. Because a secular counselor may diagnose your issue, but they cannot give you an ultimate answer. Sorry. They can give you pills, but not an ultimate answer. So happiness. One man said it this way. He said, this is a British uh, novelist, William Boyd, we all want to be happy and we're all going to die. You might say that these are the only two unchallengeable true facts that apply to every human being on the planet. We want to be happy. We know we're going to die. And I think sometimes we even try to, we treat, even try to hide the fact that we're going to die. You know, years ago, to, talking about sex in a church or in, in a men's group or whatever it was kind of taboo. Today the issue is dying. You don't hear a lot of talks on dying, but we're all going down. We're all going to die. And the question is, what do you think about that, and what's your plan? You got an insurance policy? According to the Bible, true happiness is never something that should be sought directly. It is always a result of seeking something else. It's a byproduct of something else. So if I keep, it's kind of like going down one of these hot Texas roads in the summertime when it's 120 degrees, and you see this, this, what it looks like, water ahead, but it's just a mirage. And you get up there, and it's gone. Then there's another one. Then there's another one. So what are you seeking in your life to be happy? So the context of what I'm talking about today, it comes from a passage in the Bible, the Gospel of Mark. Got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the shortest one, full of action, full of excitement, full of power. And the context for this, this chapter is Jesus and his disciples are headed to Caesarea Philippi, community. The, ge the geographical context is very important. A temple of white marble is built by Herod the Great in honor of the Caesars. It's a kind of a picture of the power of Rome uh, and like financial power or political power. The ruins of the temple, I'm told, and the shrines of the Baal orgy worship punctuate the landscape. Mount Hermon is in full view. That's the context. So what's the verse? So Jesus is huddled was his disciples, and in Matthew 8, 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Powerful question. Now, next week, we're going to take it to the next sentence, and then he looked at them and he said, but who do you say that I am? It's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of where you spend eternity. It's a matter of the quality of life you will have now. Is it going to be full of just stuff or meaning and purpose and passion because of that relationship? But today we're just going to look at one thing. Who do people say that I am? So what do Christians think? I did some research on this last week. Here are some responses I got from people 
who weren't necessarily uh, having a close affinity <laughs> with Jesus. Jesus, who is he? He was a wandering rabbi. He had no special power to heal people. No magical Jesus. No, no. A character in a myth. A character in a best-selling book. Jesus, uh, well, it's all made up. There's nothing to it. And then someone said this, if he existed at all, he was probably one of the many homeless people with a knack for feeling, making people feel sorry for him and supporting him. One guy said, don't know, beats me, who is Jesus? And on and on it goes. See, we think everybody knows about him, but they don't. I cannot tell you the number of people in Dallas, Texas, the, the, the belt buckle of the Bible right here in this city that I've met educated people, and I ask them, tell me what you know about him, about Jesus, and they stutter. So this is the pertinent subject we're going to look at today. How you answer that question is a matter of life and death, and I'm going to go into that just a little bit more in a moment. But a study was done by Lifeway publishers and researchers, and the question was, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. I wonder how you'd answer that. Would you be say, yeah, or I kind of agree with that? Oh, no, I don't agree with that. 55% of the people strongly agree. But did you hear the wording? Jesus is the first and greatest being created. Jesus wasn't created. He's always been. He's God in the body, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Read Genesis chapter 1, the first, the first 20 or 30 verses, and you'll see a little word in there that says, and let us make. Who's us? Jesus has always existed. Somehow, some way, God pulled an amazing thing off and put skin on and came on this planet. So 44% of the people somewhat disagree. And most of these people were Christians. Okay, here was another one that was very disturbing. The question is, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. So here we go. Those who strongly agree, 53%. He was not God. Rabbi, great teacher, compelling, good communicator, 47% slightly disagree. So, dear friends, things have changed, and we're living in a culture where no longer the 80%, 90% of the people, they may not be, quote, followers of Jesus, but they say, yeah, there was something extraordinary about him. I, need, I might need to check that out. So, how you answer that question has immense consequences, and it's just not answering the question, but it's having a relationship with this there was this person called Jesus, the Son of God, the God in a body. And if it's real and it's true of who he is, who he claimed to be, then it's the greatest thing you'll ever know or hear or experience. If it isn't, go keep on doing what you're doing. Try another one. We'll talk about that next week. So let's jump in then. That's all preliminary. Let me see how much time. Oh, I've done pretty good. Got 21 minutes to go. Number one. Your answer to that question will determine your relationship with God. You cannot have a relationship with God without Jesus. Now, some of you struggle with that one. I cannot tell you how many people have said to me over the years, I, I believe there's God. It's just the Jesus part that I can't, can't buy into. So if you look at John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, has a relationship with the Father apart from me. Now, that's either true. He was a crazy man, a liar, a lunatic, or a legend, but he certainly wasn't the God of the universe. Or if you look at John 8, when people say, well, I just believe in God, it's, not, it's Jesus, then they ask him, where is your Father? They ask Jesus this. You do not know me or my father, Jesus replies, talking to the Jews. If you knew me, you would know my father also. You see what he's saying? He's saying, you say you know God the Father. You can't know God the Father, and you can't have a relationship with God the Father apart from me. Now, you got you to start thinking about that and doing your homework. 
It also says in 2 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So we got a problem. We're, div- we're separated from him. How are we going to get back to him? Listen, you cannot, what I'm trying to say is this, you cannot bypass Jesus to get to God. You can't go around it. You say, well, I'll, I'll do it. You ain't going to do it. And I, I, would, I would plead with you, don't risk it because you ain't going to make it. Or all this, we just need to burn it. We've got a lot of brilliant people over the years around this world and in this country who finally relented and given their lives to Christ. Brilliant people. Were they all stupid? Were they all on drugs? Did they finally just relent? Or did they see there's something to this? And once they experienced it, they said, it's true. I want to tell you something. I've never met one man in my whole life that's come to Christ for real who's ever been the same again. The key phrase there is, for real. It's not the information that changes you. So here's here's a, a thought to summarize all this. We cannot deduce anything about Jesus from what we think we know about God. However, we must, listen to this, we must deduce everything about God from what we know about Jesus. Jesus came to help us understand what God was like. The scripture says no one had ever seen God before. They'd seen, there's theologically, there's a thing called theophanies. In the Old Testament, there were special appearances of God. But you couldn't, the brilliance and the holiness was so immense that you can't even look at that holiness. But Jesus came wrapped as a human being, God in a body. He said, I came so that you would know what the Father's like. Not only what he's like, but how you can get to him and what he wants to do in your life. Number two, your answer determines forgiveness and guilt, where, whether you're going to have it or not. Your answer determines forgiveness for guilt and shame. We all have guilt and shame. So how do we get this pardon? Well, the problem is, and I think we'll show it on the screen here in just a moment, the problem is we're separated from God. And the thing that separates us from a holy God is our stuff. We've offended God. We call it sin. Sin is not the little things we do. Sin is what I call a spiritual cancer. There's something in John Tolson that causes John Tolson to want to do what John Tolson wants to do. There's no way I can get over that that gigantic gulf and be good enough to get to a holy God. Because a holy God, the scripture says, cannot have a relationship with an unholy person. I am unholy. I can't make it on my own. I don't care how hard I try to keep the rules or whatever religion I take on. Listen to these scriptures. Leviticus. Leviticus, Old Testament. How many times y'all read Leviticus? That's a popular one. He says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. Let me tell you, when you run into the holiness of God, if you ever do, you'll, let me tell you what you'll do. You'll fall on your face. Because in the presence of holiness, you'll see your sinfulness and you'll fall on your face. And if you've never have that, had that experience, I pray you will someday. I pray you'll begin to see the holiness and the greatness of God, this is real. It's not a Sunday school story. Or if you go on to Romans 3.23, for all of sin that comes short of a holy God, what God expects. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Somehow, some way, that penalty, that sin has, has created, has to be paid. Right now, the penalty is, I'm going to die someday. But he said, there's a remedy for it. There is a solution for it. And so it says in in Acts 4.12, great passage, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name but heaven given to men by which a person can be saved or get right with a holy God. So there it is, Gandhi. This is what Gandhi said, great Hindu leader. It is a constant torture to me that I am still so far from him whom I know to be my very life and being. I know it is my own wretchedness and wickedness that keeps me from him. 
spiritual man, religious man. But he saw with all his religion and all the rules he was trying to keep, all the influence he was trying to make, he still fell short. He had no peace. He had no peace. And so, number three, your answer determines your capacity to live daily life effectively. See, this is real practical stuff. It's just not getting your ticket punch so you can go to heaven, and then we go out and do, do it the way we want to do it. So let me ask you a question. How do you deal with the disappointment you've faced in the last three days? How do you deal with the guilt and the shame? How do you deal with discouragement in your life? How do you deal with deceit? How do you, do, how do you deal with loss, maybe the loss of a loved one? How do you deal with your stress and pressure? How do you deal with anxiety? How do you deal with the daily stuff of life? He can make a difference. He can make a difference. My wife had knee surgery two weeks ago, and she, great surgery, her knee's doing fine, but they give you about 11 different kinds of medication to get you through it, and she's about to die. She doesn't take stuff. And she's calling, and they're helping her, and she's trying to reduce it. Thank God this morning she was a little better. It has nothing to do with the knee. She's got all this stuff in her. And so, again, uh, she's going to be fine, by the way. But, you know, um, I, I, I have been through enough stuff in my life that I can encourage her. I told her, I called her up a while ago. I said, sweet, I know you're struggling, but you, your old boy's going to be home tonight, and I got a little surprise for you. I'm going to give you a foot rub. <laughs> she likes her feet rubbed. She really likes that. I won't say what I was thinking, but anyway, <laughs> what I like. Anyway, uh, my first wife died after 30 years of marriage. Last four years of her life were horrible, hell, and I had to be there every day and every night, never knowing when I was going to have to call 911 again. But the Lord got me through that. As hard aching and breaking as it was, I got through it, and I've been able to help other people, and I've been able to help my own wife now. He gives you the capacity, the ability to deal with life in a way you can't on your own. And I'm a witness to that. He promises to always be with us, to never leave us nor forsake it. He said, if you don't have me, you are going to experience emptiness and that haunting sense of emptiness the rest of your life. I was talking to a guy here while before we started. He's talking about losing this person. That's, that, he, I'm the only one left in my family, but I'm doing okay. And people are tell, asking me, aren't you, why, aren't you upset? Aren't you, aren't you whatever? He said, yeah, I'm, I miss him, but I'm doing okay. That's what he can do. Down to earth, real stuff. It works. Number four, your answer determines what kind of person you become and how you're going to live. Man, we need people, we need men that are different, that rise above all the other junk around us and the inept people around us and rise above in humility and live life the way God meant us to. I'm telling you, it's exciting. I have, it, I have never, modeled, I don't know how I could live at any other kind of life than the adventure I've been through the last new birthday coming up in about a week or so. <laughs> I'm finally going to be 56. But anyway, <laughs> but let me tell you something, and I'll get into this more next week. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. You can't live it. It is a supernatural life. It's not a set of rules. You buckle up, and I'm going to keep them. I'm going to memorize those Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. I'm going to get and do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. But supernaturally, he comes into your life, and he enables you to change. He changes your heart, your perspective, how you care for people, all the rest of it. You, some of you probably made New Year's resolutions. How are How you doing with them? Yeah, well, and then they kept them for a day and a half, and then the Cowboys played. But anyway, you can't become the person he wants you to be without him living in you. It is a supernatural invasion. You say, I don't understand. That sounds like some sci-fi deal. It beats sci-fi. Let me tell you, once he invades you, 
He'll never turn you loose. Number five, your answer determines your capacity to really care and love. Some of us get tough because we played sports and we're guys and we don't know how to listen to our wives. We don't know how to talk. We get a little rough and gruff sometimes, rough around the collar. He gives you the capacity to soften yourself. But let me tell you something. A spiritual man is a real man. Some of you that are fighting this stuff, oh, that's, that's, a fem, that's effeminate to be a Christian. It ain't. It's foolish not to be one and to follow Jesus. He makes you a real man. I want to be a real man. I had a friend one time, and I said, I'll have to tell you the whole story sometime and who he was. He's dead now, and so I can tell the stories. But I was trying to get him to Christ, and it hit me one day. I said, Mark, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, do you know some people that follow Jesus, and they're, and they're, and they're weird? And you're afraid if you give your life to Jesus, he's going to make you weird? Yes, he said. I said, well, let me tell you something. If you know any followers of Jesus that are weird and Christians, they were weird ever before they became a Christian. <laughs> God is not in the business of making people weird. But that's sometimes what we think. Listen, there are always going to be a few weird people around, even Christians, and they're going to heaven if they know Jesus. So you're going to be stuck with them up there. <laughs> so listen now. Without Christ living in you, you are limited to your own limited ability to care and love. But when he comes in your life, your capacity to love your wife, your kids, your friends, even people you don't even know, with Christ in you, there is limitless of power and capacity. I love the verse in Romans 5.5. 5. Listen to this one. This is a, this is a winner. And hope does not disappoint us because God, listen, has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. When you receive Christ, you receive the power and the capacity and the ability to care and to love beyond what you ever have or been able to dream that you could do. That's why when Jesus says over in Matthew 5, love your enemies, how do you do that? How do you love somebody that cheated you in a business deal? doesn't say you have to, say you have to like them. It says you've got to love them. Two different deals. I can't do that. Humanly, I can't do that. Supernaturally, I can do that. And I've done that. So there's another great thing. All right, let me give you a couple more, and then we're out of here. Number six, your answer determines your courage to die. All right, so when you're, some of you have been close to it right here in this room. What are you going to do when you're lying there gasping for breath and you know it's over? That day's coming. I've, I've been at the bedside of people like that. I don't like it. And I'm telling them to their last breath, just say yes. Just say yes to him. Just say yes. Too bad people wait to that point and miss out on the other stuff, this side of it. But anyway, it's better to do that than not to do it at all. Courage to die. How are you going to face that? So Voltaire, I've been studying some of this heavy-duty philosophy stuff. Voltaire, the renowned French agnostic, was one of the most aggressive agnostics against Christianity. He wrote things to undermine the church. He once said, curse the wretch, speaking of Jesus. So I had to be careful of that one. I know guys that literally get so angry at God, they flip him off. I dare you. So, you know, it just shows you a little bit of the, the, the depth of the depravity in our hearts. And we've all got that capability. Just think, well, I've never done that. Well, you might. Just be careful when you're on the tollway. But anyway, <laughs> he once said, curse the wretch. In 20 years of Christianity, no, there will be no more Christianity. My single hand will destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. It is truly ironic that the house where Voltaire wrote so many of his anti-God works is still standing and today is home to a small printing endeavor that produces Bibles. <laughs> Who got the last laugh on that one? 
See, we think we're so cool and so smart and so debonair and so whatever else. If you're rejecting him, you're stupid. Stupid. I don't mean you're not created in the image of God, but you're a stupid man created in the image of God. He goes on to say, a nurse who attended Voltaire on his deathbed was reported to have said, for all the wealth in Europe, I would not see another non-believer die. It was horrific watching him die. The physician waiting upon Voltaire at his death said that he cried out most desperately, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six more months of life. Oh, Jesus, just six more months. How about Polycarp? You want, to, you want to die courageous? I want to die courageous. I do. I want to be able to die in such a way. If there are people around me, I want them to see a glow on my face. I want this, them to see a warmth in my heart. I want them to see me pointing to him and speaking about him, just like I've been speaking about him for all these years. I don't want to stop then. So listen to this one. Another Christian died, who died um, valiantly during the persecution of Rome was called Polycarp. Have respect for your old age, the Roman council said. Swear by the genius of Caesar. Polycarp said, 86 years I have served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How can I deny my king who saved me? Polycarp was taken to the stake to be burned. The guard who was ordered to torture him said, I don't want to burn you, old man. The fire will be hot, Polycarp replied. Not as hot as the fire that those who reject my Lord Jesus Christ will experience. That's what's waiting for those who don't come to Christ. You say you're trying to scare us if that's what it takes? Yes. If that's what it takes to get you to come to your senses and come to Christ? Yes. Number seven, your willingness determines your willingness your, your answer determines your willingness to believe the Bible. Jesus lived, died, rose from the dead. It's historical evidence. I can throw this away and prove that simply from documents that have been written around the time that he lived, died, and rose from the dead. He put his stamp of truthfulness on all 66 books of the Bible. Here's the book. This book. Every page, every word. Every jot, every tittle. Man, we ought to carry one with you. Open it up all the time. Got a girl break, open one up. I always have a Bible with me. I don't carry it around like this. Probably ought to sometime. But anyway, number eight, finally, your answer determines where you will spend eternity. And let me just say something here. We all are going to live forever. Now, some of you Bible church people, anal fundamentalists, which I feel I'm one of them too, but anyway, I'm watching. Everybody's going to live forever. I thought you had to listen to. Everybody's going to live forever, either with God or without Him. Everybody's going to live. When you die, if you are not a follower of Jesus, you do not cease to exist. The Bible says you are still going to be conscious. You'll be extremely aware that you missed the boat. This is what it says in the scripture in Matthew chapter number 25, verse 46. Then they will go away with eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Two kinds of people, two kinds of places. Where are you going? Here's a more, here's a more important question maybe for some of you. Where are your buddies going? Do you care enough about your buddies that are punching him in the face? Some of your children that are doing the same, some of your grandchildren, ah, they just don't go to church anymore. They moved out. We sent them to college, and they got some education, and now, you know, they won't do anything. I hope they see something in your, the dynamic of your faith that they will want what you've got. So where are you going? There's a problem. The problem is the old gap. We just looked at it a moment ago. 1 John 5, 12 says, he who has the Son uh, he does not have the, excuse me, he who has the Son has life, who does not have the Son of God, Jesus does not have life. Do you have the life? Do you have the Son? I was talking to a man as I wind this down in another city, <clears throat> actually uh, a couple I was talking to, and uh, I flew to Orlando 
Saturday morning, 745 flight out of Love Field to, for a little counseling in Orlando. Came back Saturday night. Um, and I asked this lady who was getting ready to marry this guy. She's a doctor, brilliant, compassionate. So I said, I said, I got to ask you the question. I said, I do this to everybody. So when it's all over, where are you going? Where are you going? And she kind of lowered her voice and looked down, and she said, well, heaven. I said, so what, what makes you think that? And she said, well, I'm a good doctor. I've helped a lot of people. I'm compassionate and caring. I said, I know you are. But if I weren't honest with you, I wouldn't be doing my job. That ain't going to get you one inch closer to heaven. The Bible says all your good, compassionate works are as filthy rags in God's sight. The only thing that gets you there is what fills the gap and forgives you and gets you in a relationship with the Holy God, and that's Jesus. And I looked at her and her husband, to be husband, sitting right there, and I looked at this beautiful doctor and I said, any reason why you wouldn't want to make sure? She said, no. I grabbed her hand. He grabbed her hand. I said, look me right in the eyes. Look me in the eyes. Don't close your eyes. Look me and say this after me. There's no magic in the words. It's just going to help you get this done. And she prayed a simple little prayer and asked Jesus to come in. The same Jesus that I said later will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, if something happens to you, whenever it happens to you, you can know where you're going. Do you have that certainty? Do you know that for sure? You say, you know, this has no relevance to 2023. It has all the relevance to 2023. Everything hinges on what people or what you in particular think about Jesus. Life's most important question awaits life's most important answer. So I close with this thought. When people no longer believe in God, they don't believe in nothing. They will believe in anything. So what are you believing in? Who are you believing in? Yeah, I tell you what, men, they ain't nothing like Jesus. So I want you to leave your eyes open and look at me. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to embarrass you, but if you... Say, I think he's there. I'm not sure if he's there. I know he's not. I've never asked him in. Didn't know I needed to do that. I thought going to church was enough. Giving a little money was enough. It ain't enough. Jesus is the one that gets you in. So just pray something like this. Look up here at me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I don't deserve it, but I need what you offer. Come into my life. Clean me up from this day forward. Help me to become the man you want me to be. In Jesus' name. And based upon the authority and the truthfulness of the Scripture, God cannot lie. And he said, if you ask me to come in, I will come in. So right now, if you did that, he's in you. And he'll never leave you. That's a good deal, isn't it? That is a good deal. Well, Father, thank you for our time together, and I can't wait till next week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we'll see you next week.